what then was the only super outbreak. Since then, we've had another in 2011. So I thought maybe I'd take us back a little bit to years before many of you were born and see what we found in that super outbreak, what we've learned since then, and a little bit of the comparisons between the two super outbreaks. Uh, well, it, just a, a quick overview of that outbreak uh, in all 13 states, from Michigan and Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, all the way down into a little bit of Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, the Carolinas, West Virginia, Virginia. Uh, and so it was an outbreak of 147 tornadoes in the United States in a pretty much exactly a 24-hour period. Uh, since then, we've had some outbreaks spanning longer time periods or, uh, with more tornadoes, or even in 2011, uh, a few more tornadoes in a 24-hour time period. Uh, some things about the super outbreak, 74 of them have still not been exceeded. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so a few lessons, what have we learned from the, the 74 outbreak, or lessons that we've learned since then. I'll talk a little bit about some of those. Um, lesson number one was that, at least for many years, and to some extent still, the 74 super outbreak was the benchmark by which all other outbreaks were judged. Uh, here we have uh, one of the more notable tornadoes, uh, Hippozinia, Ohio. Uh, here we have a photograph of that large uh, wedge tornado bearing down on, on Xenia, Ohio. Uh, there is the outbreak. Uh, at, uh, at that time, it was basically the number one outbreak in the United States until uh, 2011 came along, still has many of the records for outbreaks that have occurred in the United States. It had six tornadoes rated F5, 24 that were rated F4, 92 that were rated F2, a strong order. Was, uh, that was what uh, Dr. Regina rated, National Weather Service, the storm data has 97, so there's some uh, discrepancies as you begin to get down into the, a few of the somewhat weaker tornadoes. There were 48 tornadoes in the outbreak that were killers, more than uh, 5,000 injuries, more than 2,500 miles of path length in that outbreak. And uh, the, uh, at that time, at least, most tornadoes in 24 hours, we've uh, 170 in 35 hours in, in 2004, and as we'll see, uh, even more than that in, in periods in, in 2011. Um, I thought it would take a little bit, take you a little bit back into history. You know, many of you may not have seen some of this. Uh, how, at that time, the National Weather Service had only really begun assigning the Fujita scale for a few years. Dr. Fujita developed the Fujita scale in 1971. Uh, he basically handed that off with some training, uh, elementary training manuals for the National Weather Service in '73. Uh, it was a far different era. It was not the kind of uh, systematic surveying done by the National Weather Service offices at the time that is, is done now uh, on, in many instances. And so uh, it was a, a fairly massive effort to come up with uh, what all went on in terms of how many tornadoes and where they occurred in this, in this particular outbreak. Prior to 1971, by the way, for those of you that don't know a lot about the history, but there was basically you know, all of the tornadoes uh, that all the ratings for tornadoes prior to 1971 have been done after the fact by groups uh, at Chicago at uh, the Storm Prediction Center. So in some cases, students going back and looking into the storm data listings, going back into the newspaper in the clippings and, and assigning the Fujita scale that way. And in terms of much of the storm data that was collected in real time, a lot of that was done by subscription by the National Weather Service to clipping services that would give them clippings out of newspapers that mentioned storms. So the farther back in time you go, the fewer of the zero and one rated tornadoes that are in the database. So that's partly why the number of reported tornadoes has been going up over the decades. We now, uh, you chase them, you take video of them. The National Weather Service uh, has many social contacts uh, and, and we do a lot more surveying now than, than was ever done in the past. Uh, the 1974 super outbreak, 148 tornadoes, uh, one arguable whether it was a tornado or a lightning burst in uh, Windsor, Ontario. Uh, one tornado that was originally 
uh, classified as a tornado, was reclassified as a downburst in the Tennessee, Virginia area. The downburst basically Dr. Vegeta uh, came up with in, in research of that phenomenon, strong damaging down uh, draft winds in 1975, and uh, the what had been once a longer track Monticello tornado was reclassified as two tornadoes. So, sort of the number of tornadoes is at least, uh, as I understand it, is, is pretty much stayed the same with a little bit of reclassification. Depending on, as we all, as always, there's some uh, issues of exactly how many were the direct fatalities, the total fatalities. They're always a little bit un unknown. I think the National Weather Service official is 310. You can see some reports as many as 335, some variations in the number of injured, uh, the, the number of hospitalized, etc. Um, the uh, certainly one of the things the radar was certainly not then what it is now, but looking at uh, and that was part of my PhD thesis, looking at radar microfilm from all the radars around the country. It seemed as if about uh, 106 of the tornadoes, or 72 percent of them, were made up by uh, 33 supercells, or at least 33 thunderstorms that we couldn't always tell at that point that they were supercells just by looking at them. But seemed like they were families produced by the, the same thunderstorm, and uh, it was quite a day. There were at least uh, 15 at times tornadoes on the ground simultaneously, and uh, there were more than 300 tornado and severe thunderstorm warnings issued. So a little bit of the uh, way in which the benchmark was established the, in terms of the surveying effort. Uh, uh, on April 3rd, in fact, uh, the outbreak changed my career. Dr. Fujita had pretty much run out of research funding. I was a graduate student studying under him at the time. And uh, I was literally in an interview for a uh, what it was going to be a tropical boundary layer research project to go be looking in off of Africa at some of the easterly waves coming out that would go on to become a hurricane. So uh, what, but for the super outbreak 74, I might have been a hurricane expert instead of a tornado expert. Uh, you know, in reality, I was literally in an interview meeting that day. About 3 o'clock, one of uh, our staff meteorologists came running in and said, sorry to interrupt, but there's a rotating thunderstorm overhead. And we ran up to the roof, of course, uh, <laughs> instead of down in the basement. Uh, hail was falling. Uh, by 6 o'clock, uh, Dr. Fujita he, he's had his wife collect some of the hailstones, and he's at home having a, uh, a scotch on the, on the stones, uh, using that to collect the hailstones. And uh, by 7 o'clock, he gets a call from Alan Pearson, then the director of the National Severe Storm Forecast Center, which is at that time, but which is now the Storm Prediction Center, uh, saying that he thinks it's a historic day and uh, we're going to be, be pretty busy. Uh, so uh, Dr. Fujita gives us uh, all of us phone calls and we're going to have a, a meeting the next morning. We have an early staff meeting, everybody in all hands kind of meeting to begin uh, preparing collecting our damage survey maps, getting films, getting the camera ready, making uh, arrangements to rent Cessna high-wing high Cessna aircraft that we can go out and fly, uh, doing a quick as possible aerial mapping of the, of the tornado damage. Uh, oops, at that point, we, uh, we thought there was probably about 105 tornadoes over 12 states. Some of the initial readings that we're getting from the National Weather Service, the, the media, we're frantically trying to jot down locations of some of these. Uh, on uh, April 5th, uh, we begin heading out in three teams. I'll show you a little bit more about that. We do a, some initial surveys, get back on April 8th. We plan for another round of surveys to, and the uh, five teams to head out on the 9th and 10th of April. And then we did, especially me and, and Dr. Fujita, uh, we did some uh, spotty, sporadic follow up on straggler reports that came in, uh, mostly in forested areas where the trees were still there and you could see if it was tornado or <coughs> check on the path. Uh, so we were doing some of that, uh, especially down in the south as long as uh, the 23rd of July. So it, we, there was quite an effort that went into this. The initial uh, task that first morning, the next morning was that uh, Dr. Vegeta sort of uh, divided up some of the area, we had some known, and this is sort of just a, a Xerox of, 
some of what we kind of thought, and there might have even at that point been a pretty long track coming up across Indiana. And so uh, he divided closest to the University of Chicago area, let three graduate students, myself, Bob Paskin, Bob Laplaca, uh, to uh, survey that area. You see the sort of dark and shaded lines. Uh, Ed Pearl and Jamie Texan, a couple staff meteorologists, to fly the Ohio Valley, including the initial uh, flight over the Zini area. Dr. Fujita and a staff meteorologist, William Sereno, uh, took a, a little bit faster, uh, higher speed Cessna aircraft and went the farthest down into the <coughs> Gulf Coast states and, and Tennessee Valley. Dr. Fujita, though, before it was all said and done, basically uh, relooked at many of the paths that, that some of those other uh, uh, teams had done as well. Uh, we, were, we armed ourselves with U.S. Geological Survey maps about to 1 to 250,000 scale on those original maps then about miles, about a quarter inch. And uh, with a map looking out the window of the aircraft, map it, take some photographs, sort of circle or, or zigzag our way along the path uh, along the way. Uh, a picture of me at that point I had here. The, uh, got a long hair as the style of the time. The high, High-winged aircraft. We're uh, we're gearing up. I'm in London and Corbin refueling at that point. I guess that was one of my su subsequent summer flights uh, to, to fill in. Some of the initial reports that we were going on, uh, we sort of had a you know, what were uh, dots on the map, a few uh, a few spots there that we would begin to, to check out. We had sort of. Uh, Goals in mind, Dr. Fujita had done enough damage surveys in the past. We knew about things like tornado families, that there would be left turns, gaps, reformations. So we were going to those damage spots and then looking upstream and downstream, doing a little bit of zigzagging back and forth in the gaps to, to try to establish as much as we could where the tornadoes began and ended. Uh, that said, it's pretty hard to see F zero damage from the aircraft. So we think we probably did a pretty good job of capturing all the F1 or higher uh, tornadoes, but maybe missed a few F zeros uh, along, the way, along the way. After that initial round of surveys, we had taken those dots and, and uh, come up with this a series of uh, tornadoes. You can see here number four through number nine, I guess it is, is obviously one family of tornadoes from a long lived uh, thunderstorm. There are other families. You can see some of the obvious ones. The 27 <coughs> through 32 is one family. 34, 5, 6, or 24, 5, 6, I'm not sure. The one that starts with Dayton, the Xenia tornado there is a separate supercell. And then the overlapping families of, of thunderstorms in some places down here in the Gulf Coast state. So we had made a pretty good uh, inroad after those first few days. 93 tracks now have been confirmed. Uh, by the, uh, September, after those additional rounds of surveys, uh, the University of Chicago team then had confirmed 127 of uh, 148 tracks, and uh, with the uh, additional 21 uh, filled in by some of the local information then that the National Weather Service uh, got that, that we never uh, got around the survey. So, uh, that is basically the story of the, the mapping of the, of the Super Outbreak 74. Uh, some of the things you may not know, Dr. Vegeta flew about 13,000 miles, some of his approximate tracks, a uh, zigzagging along. Um, initially, he was not funded for the effort, so initially, all of our, uh, all of our Cessna rental and, uh, and the pho pho photography and so on was funded out of his bank account. He subsequently was able to get reimbursed by the, uh, the National Weather Service for that, but he was taking some gamble. Uh, and uh, basically enough that he could have flown about halfway around the world in, in all of uh, his own flights and then plus the others that we took. Uh, sort of a repl replication of one of the, those uh, geological survey maps here, the, the tornado that went through Monticello, Indiana, uh, tracking along at least part of the track, sort of approximating. <coughs> and here, probably that distance is about a quarter mile, a quarter inch on the map, so that's about a mile wide, zipping up along the way. Then he would, would add to that in terms of uh, what we were gaining from 
reports from newspapers or from National Weather Service, some of the fatality locations on many bus here, for example, in Monticello. Uh, some uh, uh, college school team, a female school team, I forget what they were, what their sport was, was blown off of a bridge, a number of fatalities there. And so uh, he was, in fact, gathering this for scientifically, but he was also in the process of trying to put together a book that would uh, describe the outbreak, uh, but uh, that got sort of detoured along the way. Uh, he did ultimately pr produce a, um, what we sort of know as his memoirs book in the 90s that uh, he talked about, some about the super outbreak, some of his other various life experiences and research experiences. In that, he said that the, uh, the Xenia, Ohio, or Brandenburg, Kentucky damage was the worst that he had been seen from the air, and he rated six of the tornadoes, uh, five on the uh, Fujita scale. Uh, after the survey uh, was done, we had a, a pizza party, a few of the other characters there, Dr. Fujita, uh, his, uh, you see their uh, label just to, his, uh, to the uh, lower right of him, his, his wife, Susie, so, Ed Pearl that I mentioned, Jamie Texan, Bob LaPlaca, myself, back in the, sort of the top middle of the picture, along here there, Julian Serena and uh, Serino, and taking pictures over at the right, Bob Paskin, uh, some other uh, of the staff meteorologists, and, and uh, uh, a number of the others that are in the picture were some of the, uh, a lot of times they were geography students that Dr. Fujita had hired, they were some of the students in his team that were going back and applying that newly invented Fujita scale to uh, assign Fujita scale ratings to the tornadoes prior to 1971-72. So those are mostly what some of the other folks in the, in the picture were doing. Uh, the gentleman just to the right of Dr. Fujita was uh, Vince Angus. You may have seen occasionally pictures of Fujita's whirling a blade tornado machine. Mr. Angus is, was the, uh, the uh, machinist who uh, built the tornado machine. Uh, lesson two uh, was that the super outbreak gave us a chance to do some unprecedented tornado statistics. Things like, we, we now know, we certainly now know that not every part of an F5 tornado, not every part of the area is rated an F5. It's a small area, uh, but the statistics of that, in terms of things that maybe statisticians could use, people, uh, actuaries who were trying to come up and, and get the, the probability of tornadic winds at a particular location, there was no basis for that. And so uh, that led to uh, some of the detailed mappings that Dr. Fujita did and, uh, and using some of the detailed photographs that he took. Here, for example, the tornado that hit uh, parts of the Louisville metro area, detailed mappings of uh, sort of the zero, and, and, and uh, I guess this would have been the, the F2 or higher portions of the path, and even more detail than that, uh, carefully going through and measuring the area, it was F0, the area F1, F2, F3, etc. Uh, gave Dr. Virginia the chance to go through and do the damage area per path length, how much, what fraction of the area then was an F5 out of the total area on the average of these F5 tornadoes may not be general for the, a whole year's worth of tornadoes, but it's certainly the, the best data that we had. Incidentally, there was a uh, the meteorologist at the time on uh, yeah, Louisville was on air doing live radio interview, saw the tornado coming and said <coughs> something to the effect that the tornado is coming on the boy, uh, and uh, abandoned his interview and but gave the gave the warning to the public. So some of these detailed mappings, for example, in the Monticello, Indiana area, this, is, uh, this was one of my tornado uh, survey areas and some of my photography, so uh, some of this looks then like the, the zero in red and green, uh, one, blues, twos, and then threes, fours, fives, threes and fours in this case, a little bit higher. So you can see that it was only sort of little spots. Maybe some of that is related to weaker engineering, maybe some of that is related to suction vortices embedded in the tornado, but it's not every spot, as you're probably well aware, that gets, uh, gets that F5 uh, tornado damage. Uh, also, questionnaires were requested in some locations, including uh, Gouin in Alabama. Uh, that got published in a, in a newspaper, 
And there were a number of responses sent in uh, that indicated uh, where they were located and then uh, descriptions of the damage that occurred at those Lake locations. And then uh, this one was a, uh, a seven-room Rick Veneer home, uh, four-room uh, cedar, I can't shaker house. Uh, two of the houses there were destroyed next to the Methodist church, etc. So collect as much detail in many cases, especially for some of the F5 tornadoes, as, uh, as possible. Here was Gouin, Alabama, as part of one of the long track tornadoes that moved through. A lot of fatalities in the community of Gouin, but it continued along off of this panel of the USGS survey map and continued on to additional, additional map uh, areas. Uh, big enough that, as we see now, subsequently, in a number of times in the Earth resources of these Earth sensing uh, satellites, uh, you can see that because of the forest that was knocked down, you can see the narrow line path in the satellite imagery of that Gruen tornado. Uh, a more aerial photograph here of the, of the tornado. You can sort of barely see the, the little lines in there, the trees. Three trunks that are laying down in the midst of this big wider area where you're now seeing down to the ground. And uh, detailed analyses were done of all of these to look at the tree fall patterns, looking for suction swaths uh, that, that went through. Some interesting things come from the violet tornado tracks near Tanner in Alabama, not too far away from the Huntsville area. Uh, back to back, maybe 45 minutes apart, supercells rolled through the area, uh, affecting the considering the tornado width. Uh, some places getting hit or getting threatened a couple of times in that evening time period. And looking at a couple of those, one tornado basically lifting off, maybe still a little bit of a funnel cloud coming up into Huntsville, while the next tornado in the family was, uh, was going and then developing and going across the south part of Huntsville. And then a couple of these back-to-back -back tornadoes, 654, then the next one, 726, a couple of these subsequent supercells going across the area. Very, uh, not unlike what happened then in 2011, a lot of sort of congestion of tornadoes in some of these Alabama locations. They're a little bit more separated in uh, many of the areas farther to the north. Uh, in some cases, even some crossover points that did get hit twice in, uh, in parts of Alabama. Uh, the tornadoes went up and down mountains in many cases more or less unaffected. So a lot of detailed mapping was done and leading to this dapple with damage area per path length uh, and sort of the bottom line there, in the studies that were done, only about two tenths of a percent of the area of the total damage of an F5 tornado actually was F5 damage. Less than 1% of uh, the total damage from an F5 tornado was rated F4 or so. So sort of the bottom line to that is that uh, even if it's a violent tornado coming at your location, if, if you're taking the proper safety precautions, there's a pretty good chance that your location may not get the worst of the damage and you may be able to survive, uh, even, especially if you have a tornado shower, but doing the right thing even if you don't, you may get lucky and be spared. Uh, so if you, if you go down this, this column here under the five, of course, 100% of the F5 of the tornado has at least zero damage. About 30%, 32% has F1 or higher damage, etc. as you get down to the .002. A lot of detailed uh, eye work going into making those computations. Lesson three, we've seen, of course, many times, including the El Reno tornado, but certainly pretty well known and very well documented. It was more a theory than a fact going into the super outbreak, the tornadoes contained multiple vortices. We had seen in a number of surveys uh, prior to that these looping marks, uh, cycloidal marks as they're called, in things like cornfield. Cornfields, they're stubble, little piles of corn stubble that have been accumulated into the inflow and the updraft into the suction vortices, or at least that's the, the case in, in some instances. Uh, we were able to document that though because in the rarity of movies and video at, at that time of tornadoes compared to now, we got some of the first footage of actually tornadoes in progress. And this one uh, near Muncie, Indiana, Parker, Indiana, 
uh, a tornado basically covering the, the picture here from left to right, but with one, two, three, four embedded vortices, with one here that's on the back side going back <coughs> down, one that's lifting in the front right side, and then two that are sort of on the right side or rounding the, the south side of the tornado. So we were able to use movies of this uh, and, and document that. Here's the location east of Muncie, Indiana. Uh, one or so fatalities from that, it damaged the Monroe Central High School as it tracked along more or less a straight path, not totally straight. Uh, it broke down from being one wide tornado into a tornado that, that had these multiple vortices. We have pretty detailed uh, photo lab and photo capability, so we took and re-photographed frame by frame that original movie and re-registered it such that we could hold the, an individual suction vortex still and then see if you could get uh, some of the, track some of the individual elements of the funnel uh, revolving about that. Uh, and uh, we're able to track some of these sort of 40 to 60 meter per second, 100 to a little over 100 mile per hour rotations embedded around the speed of rotation of the, in some of these individual suction vortices. Uh, there were other tornadoes that had that. Uh, the Xenia, Ohio, had a couple of these suction vortices, in this case, sort of on the back side, going from right to left. In fact, even with a, some suggestion of a couple of wee little tiny ones revolving about themselves uh, in this particular movie, and they're moving kind of like what we heard of some of the speeds in, in Xenia, uh, in El Reno, 190 mile per hour uh, in this particular case. So, some of that leads to sort of what we've learned in, in the in intervening years, things about debu debunking some of the myths, the, the skipping tornadoes concept. Well, we have those gaps between the, the subsequent tornadoes in the tornado family that can sometimes mean your location was missed, whereas a lot or so away uh, were damaged. And then you have the, the house across the street. Well, if you're in one of the paths of the, on, the, on the right side of one of the section vortices where the winds add up, you're destroyed if you're in one of the gaps that were missed by the section vortices. Maybe you're largely spared. And of course, the engineers have told us that it's a lot about the exposure, whether or not your garage door is facing into or away from the wind, that can also play a role in, in some of that uh, hit or miss one side of the street versus others. We sort of knew, but there was still, and even to this day, you can hear lots of myths about tornadoes can't hit cities or it can't hit rivers or can't. Hit mountains. Uh, we, we've certainly learned in that outbreak, and since there is no safe place for tornadoes, uh, at that point we certainly knew that it was wind, not pressure. Don't open the windows, but it was not very long. Uh, and it, in fact, there were a lot of people uh, still practicing preaching that rule of open the windows. And it's the pressure. We know, of course, that it's the wind force on the sides of the buildings. The wind being lifted up, pulling the wind up, lift, and the speeding up over the roofs that helps lift up the roof, and then a cascade of failure that leads to the collapse of buildings. Wind pressures not to trap the ambient pressure of a higher initially, and then the tornado coming over with its internal lower pressure. It's not that pressure differential that's causing buildings to explode or collapse. So lots of things that have changed over 40 years. Some of Dr. Fujita's mapping of tornadoes going right up across steep ravines in uh, Murphy, North Carolina, an F4 tornado, one of the pictures from his memoirs book, coming right down uh, steep embankments toward, you can see there, sort of the confluence of some of the trees in the herringbone kind of pattern as the winds are spiraling into the tornado center, right down the banks to the Ohio River. Uh, and then, uh, Oops. And then crossing, crossing the Ohio River, going up into uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Now the other thing that was done a lot, uh, we, we tried to make an effort to go out and then find the location exactly where the movies were taken from, so that we could know the exact distance uh, of the photo location from the tornado. Then you could go through and use the angles that you could measure from the movie to convert that to actual distances, the speed then from the, the framing rate of the, of the movie, 
use that for speeds. And so a lot of what's called photogrammet photogrammetry was done as this tornado came across the river. Here's some of Dr. G's book, uh, work published in uh, his memoirs book. Uh, a lot of very fast updrafts, maybe uh, 50, 60 up plus upward motions. Uh, at this point, kind of even weaker horizontal rotations. The tornadoes go through fast upward stages, and then sometimes you go into uh, stronger rotation stages, as you're seeing here, sort of mostly up, up bursts, as he was calling it, uh, 56 meters per second, 125 mile per hour updraft. He's measuring into this little cloud tag coming up, but then beginning to go into uh, transition into 170 mile per hour rotation. So, as you're well aware, sometimes the tornadoes have those updraft stages and then go into the, the rotation stages as well. Uh, one of the uh, tornadoes that Dr. Virginia thought was one of the more impressive to him, the strong ones, was Brandenburg, Kentucky. Picture here from the Meade County <coughs> Messenger in Brandenburg of what it looked like beforehand. A tornado coming in from the southwest toward the Ohio River that's in the southeast. And uh, an aerial photo um, of nothing but piles of rubble then as the tornado came in from the southwest. Uh, a little swath here down in the a little bit of a ravine up on the plateau, a more comprehensive swath, and then it continued out over the, the river. Uh, lesson five, and we've of course learned a lot more about this than what we were basically forming as hypotheses at the time, but things about the relationship between tornadoes and, and the parent thunderstorm and its related winds, uh, things about tornado turns and tornado families. We already knew about tornado families, a little bit about turns, but began to form a few additional hypotheses. Uh, radar at the time was a lot cruder than we have right now. Uh, the, the radars basically, it was black or white with a few of the radars had untoward intensity schemes on it. There was no Doppler velocities. The Xenia Ohio tornado basically formed as a, a body of the storm with one little, probably what we would call a debris ball now, uh, first showing up the presence, the location of the tornado. The hook, basically, at least in this measurement scheme, not well defined. The Hamburg, Indiana tornado uh, had, uh, again, the main body of the storm, a bit of a hook echo, a bit of what we would call now as a debris ball. And then uh, the Cincinnati radar here showing uh, three of the families with uh, hook echoes of various uh, shapes and, and uh, uh, definition of a hook. What we uh, we also saw were that if you looked as a function of time, uh, and we knew that at the time that the rotation rotating storms tend to move a little bit to the right. But what we saw in this outbreak was that with time, the supercell storms tended to march themselves a little bit to the right by moving to the right of the ordinary storms, the, the shaded here, the supercell, or at least the, the right moving storms. Uh, and the, the others be, becoming another non tornadic line. Uh, the, the storms in the outbreak themselves were basically in three lines one up in Illinois, Indiana, another line from Mississippi up into Ohio, and, and a third line from down in Alabama over into the Carolinas. Within that, though, the storms sorted themselves, and by virtue of moving to the right, the, the supercell thunderstorms gave themselves a little bit better chance to get the un-rain uh, contaminated inflow coming in from the, the southeast. So a few of the radars were had some contouring of, of reflectivity, uh, light, moderate, heavy, and in fact, one of the longer lived tornadoes of the outbreak was in one that was sort of an embedded supercell, embedded in more or less a solid line right in here. You see this little comma shape. It at times, uh, the comma had basically a, a rotating supercell embedded in the line with a tornado, a largely rain wrap, marching right along that with, with more than 100 long mile, mile long path, despite that not being an isolated supercell character. So, not all these long track tornadoes and these isolated supercells. This one was uh, one of the more interesting. It's uh, too bad that we didn't have Doppler radar to, uh, to look at that one. We certainly saw in some of the photos and videos uh, some of the 
roping on stages, but this one was still an F5 coming into the suburbs of Cincinnati, Sailor Park. Having crossed the Ohio River, it was still F5 damage being caused at the time. It's beginning, though, the, the leading edge of it being uh, pulled off to the northeast while the, the base of it, of the tornado, is getting left behind. And so that led uh, Dr. Fujita to begin to develop some conceptual models that, that we now so, sort of understand from some of the Doppler radar research that has gone on since then to be the case. We, we certainly have learned about rear flank diagrams. And so at this point, the, uh, the mesocyclone, uh, where the tornado likes to originate, but then the, the rear flank diagram coming down, spreading around, maybe revolving about that and choking off the tornado. So the, the tendency, at least in the hypothesis and, and the behavior of some of the tornadoes in the super outbreak, the tornadoes were forming a little bit to the left of the hook in the mesocyclone, and then with the rear flank diagram wrapping around as we now know it, a lot of those tornadoes will make systematic left turns. Some of the tornadoes, the hypothesis was, we knew from the damage that they were making right turns, the hypothesis was that some of those may be on this rear flank diagram's gust front and were being pushed a little bit to the right as that gust front spread up. I'm not totally sure that that one is as well defined as uh, well confirmed in the, in the subsequent. In a little bit more detail here, Vegeta published uh, in 1978 in his Downburst Manual. Uh, the uh, Don Graft, some of the air wrapping around, that cooler, denser air, pushing the tornado back and leaving it behind while the, the parent thunderstorm is uh, moving along and maybe a new tornado then forming where the fresher, warmer air inflow is coming back into the mesocyclone. So this schematic there of the tilting out stage and a new one in the family beginning to form. Uh, and, and of course, we saw then, we saw before that, we've seen since then, many examples of this left turn. John Davies talked about that. Uh, then the next tornado forming a few miles off to the right, more or less where the mesocyclone had been heading, maybe just a slight amount farther to the right than that. Saw this repeatedly. Um, one of the things we also saw, and at that point didn't as much understand, but that Monticello tornado family track, we were seeing a lot of these broad, what you might sometimes think were scrape marks on the ground, but it, it was not. It were little bits of corn stubble that were being strayed along by the, by the broader winds. You can see a, a cyclonic curvature to that. Well, we now sort of understand that at that time, Dr. Fujita called that a twisting down draft, a twisting down burst. We, we now sort of know that that would have been the kind of clockwise rotating or flank, flank down draft winds pushing around that embedded supercell that I talked about in that line echo wave pattern or bow echo. Uh, and at times, that dominated such that the damage became pretty much losing that convergence and rotation and upward inflow into the tornado. And instead, the damage path was characterized more by those winds that you just saw those marks you saw in the last photograph. So one of the part of the tornado, the Monticello tornado track near the beginning was uh, broken off into a second tornado. And, uh, and then we had a, a separate spot, or originally we had called it a separate tornado, that we saw another one of these came down. Don Graft choked off the original tornado, but maybe at the edge of that twisting Don Graft as we now know, is one of the leading theories for Vortex 2's results is that some of that twisting down graph, that earth length down graph, means at the edge of that is the source of the rotation for tornado genesis. So we were seeing some of that in the, in the next tornado would form in that family. So some of the things have, that we were sort of suspecting have, have since been, been seen and confirmed. Interesting thing though that Maybe occasionally the, the twisting diagraph would come down and just sort of smack down the whole tornado. There were a few tornadoes that ended very wide and sort of began to lose their, their convergence, became just more straight line winds. Uh, there's the one I showed you with downburst disrupted the tornado. This one sort of just ended uh, entirely uh, getting wider and weaker along the way. Uh, lesson seven. Uh, why such a massive outbreak? Well, partly because it had three lines. It was a very strong jet stream dug 
Indians in the Pacific into the southwest, blasted across the area. So tremendous amounts of wind energy, uh, deep tropospheric cyclogenesis, big uh, surface, uh, big jet streak uh, formed to cut off flow. And we also have learned, the researchers have learned that there were some gravity waves marched east of that jet stream that was some of the trigger for some